All right, our next speaker is Dr. Mamerian. He is, uh, needs no introduction to this crowd. He is our head of nuclear and CT, uh, professor of cardiology here at Houston Methodist and Weill Cornell and uh, past president of the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology, John. So that's why I'm talking about CT today. I... <laughs> and um, before I get started here, can we plug this in, please? All right. Uh, I also want to highlight that uh, I'm interested. It was very interesting that Dr. Zogbius showed a, a slide showing that CT is actually the most rapid growing of all the technologies. So we'll talk about that and, and maybe why that is. So we're going to talk about CT, and that's going to involve both non-contrast CT, which is calcium scoring, which is becoming very important in the asymptomatic population, as well as contrast CT, which is becoming more important in the symptomatic population. So it's important to make that distinction. And uh, just to talk a little bit about calcium scoring, you know, there's a tremendous amount of data out there. These are data from MESA showing that in patients with calcium scores of zero, they have an extremely low event rate, like 0.15% per year. So a very good way of identifying a low risk population. Whereas those with higher calcium scores have a much higher risk of having an event. In fact, in the over 400 population, it's over 2% per year. So a, a nice way of describing not only whether you have plaque, but also what your risk factors are. This is true in both men and women. These are data from our laboratory showing that irrespective of gender, as the calcium score goes up, events go up. And again, in the calcium score zero or le very low calcium scores, the event rates are extremely low. This has also been shown in the MESA population, again, showing that it's in the high calcium score group that you see events in the low calcium score group in women, uh, very, very low event rates. Now, the other important thing about calcium scores is you know, risk stratifies beyond clinical uh, uh, risk factors. And these are data from the uh, heinz zixdorf recall study showing that on the left, if you look at Framingham risk score, or on the right, you look at the adult treatment panel uh, three guidelines, that calcium score is significantly added to reclassifying risk uh, e using either of those clinical risk models. We have also shown that after you do a calcium score, you can identify who really needs some kind of other functional testing. And these are data from multiple studies, including our own from He et al. in, in Circulation 2000, showing if you have a normal calcium score of zero, you have an extremely low likelihood of having an abnormal uh, uh, myocardial perfusion scan. But over 400, it goes up to over 20%. But luckily, that it only involves 10% of patients. So you can just identify those very high-risk patients who then require other functional testing. The only caveat is those who have metabolic syndrome, such as diabetes, where you, even in the moderate group, you have a significant increase in spec positivity in that population. This is just an example. This is a 51-year-old male, asymptomatic, several risk factors, intermediate Framingham risk score. You can see on his calcium score that he had multiple areas of calcification. The calcium score was 780, OK? Because of that, he went for a myocardial perfusion scan. He went 11 minutes on the Bruce, got up to a good heart rate, 13 Mets, just a little bit of fatigue, Duke treadmill score, 11 low risk. His perfusion scan was not low risk. It showed large ischemic abnormalities in the LE territory. The EF was normal, however, and you can see the total defect size was 30% of the myocardium. He went for cath. He had a lesion in the right. He had subtotal occlusion of the LAD. Again, asymptomatic individual. He went for an angioplasty and uh, had a subsequent nuke showing a completely normal uh, uh, study. So again, this is a kind of population. That, asymptomatic but very high calcium score who might benefit from, from, uh, from uh, imaging. And again, calcium scoring can act as a gatekeeper. And again, in those with, with high risk uh, calcium scores, those would be the ones you send for imaging. We have also shown in a very large study out to 11 year follow-up, uh, you know, almost 1,000 patients, um, the value of calcium scoring in people who are referred for normal myocardial perfusion scans. Now, you think about a normal perfusion scan, you should be doing extremely well. And in, but in fact, that's not necessarily the case. If you have a severe calcium score, that warranty period of that normal nuclear study is only one to two, at most three years, okay? And in fact, if you look at the number of people in this study who had abnormal calcium scores despite a normal myocardial perfusion scan, 
you can see it was a large number of patients. In fact, 21% had calcium scores over 400. So the beautiful thing about calcium scoring and the bad thing about SPECT, SPECT identifies high advanced risk disease, but it doesn't, it doesn't identify early atherosclerotic disease, which is the beauty of calcium scoring. Why is that important? Because we know that statin therapy is extremely uh, effective in terms of reducing plaque burden and getting regression. We know from secondary prevention trials that you can significantly reduce event rates with statins, and that is also true in primary prevention trials, the most recent trial being Jupiter, where the LDL was actually down to 55 uh, in terms of being able to show improvement. So the rationale for therapy then is that cholesterol, specifically LDL, clearly is instrumental in the development of atherosclerotic disease. Statins provide the best opportunity for plaque regression and improved event-free survival. The question is, how low do you go with LDL? That still hasn't been answered. It may be a bottomless pit. We don't know. We know that the ACCHA guidelines recommend a whole bunch of people now for using statins. But the question is, do we really put statins in the drinking water? I don't know. Maybe we should. But I think really what we should do is target those based on whether they have calcium or not. And there is some data. This paper just came out in, in Jack uh, Cardiovascular Imaging Look at, looking at applying the MESA database to clinical primary prevention trials, randomized trials with statin therapy. So these are the trials that were looked at. It includes Jupiter as one of those studies. And these are the patients that were uh, eligible and not eligible. And what you'll see, what they did is they took MESA patients who fit into these trials who were not on statins to begin with, and then they looked at how many of those had calcium scores of zero. And you can see that 44% of all of the patients had a calcium score of zero. And that was the same in men and women, a little bit higher even in women, 54%. And then they looked at event rates in these populations. You can see if you had a calcium score of zero, the event rates, whether you're looking at atherosclerotic disease or coronary heart disease, was like 0.15% per year. So why would you give a statin to that population? And in fact, that's exactly what they looked at. How many patients would you need to treat with a calcium score of zero? And you can see you'd have to treat 80 to 100 patients for atherosclerotic disease and over 200 patients for coronary heart disease uh, to, get, to prevent one event over 10 years. Look at if you had calcium scores over uh, 100, much lower and much more effective. So, in the asymptomatic population, CTA is not, is not appropriate. Functional testing, generally speaking, not appropriate unless someone has high calcium scores. And calcium scoring is the preferred test. What about symptomatic patients? CTA. CTA is a great test, and, it's just, and it is more than pretty pictures. Because of the technology we have, this is an old standard camera. On the right, you see our camera, extremely fast, very good temporal resolution. And in that regard, we're able to even take patients with very high heart rates and get exquisite pictures, as you can see here. This is the reason, because if you look at the shutter speed, so to speak, of the camera, if you have a slow shutter speed, you get blurring. If you have a fast shutter speed, you get really crystal clear imaging. What are the indications for CTA? Detection and evaluation of symptomatic patients, acute chest pain patients, patients with new heart, heart, heart failure with reduced DF, assessment prior to non-cardiac surgery, and those with discordant stress or nuclear study uh, results, evaluation of graft patency, evaluation of, of stent patency, detection of anomalies, localization of bypass grafts prior to another chest procedure, and many, many other non-coronary findings. The strength of CTA is its negative predictive value, being able to say that patients do not have disease, okay? And uh, this is just an example. This is identifying stenosis. This is excluding stenosis. And this is a patient with a stent in terms of being able to identify stent patency as well as other disease, as you can see here. We also look at bypass grafts very effectively. This is a patient with a bypass graft who's got a lesion. And we do that with over 95% sensitivity and specificity. We also can identify patients with non-cardiac, uh, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. And again, the negative predictive value is key here in being able to say that if you have a normal CT, it's not due to coronary disease, that your ejection fraction is low. This is an example. This is a patient, uh, this is a patient with an echo. You can see very, very poor ejection fraction. This patient actually had valvular heart disease. You can see here he had a normally functioning uh, uh, valve by CT. These are his coronary arteries normal LAD, normal CERC, normal right, 
And he actually went for a cath, I guess, because they didn't believe the CT results. And he had normal, he had normal coronary arteries <laughs> by, uh, by, uh, by invasive angiography as well. So very good at, at non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. This is another patient with a very, very large coronary sinus. There was a coronary sinus uh, fistula from the right coronary to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the coronary sinus. I think that Dr. Lowry probably remembers this case. And uh, we were able to very nicely identify where that went into the coronary sinus. This is the picture of the 3D picture here. So coronary anomalies are very easy to find. This is another patient who had a left main coronary coming off the uh, right cusp. And you can see that 3D as well. That's a high risk individual. Just to kind of summarize here, there are many, many studies looking at prognosis. And uh, obviously, the bottom line is that there are basically no events in patients with no CAD and in those with non-obstructive CAD. We can use different ways of looking at remodeling, et cetera, as well as fractional flow reserve now to look at events. This is someone with a moderate lesion who had an abnormal flow reserve and someone with a, also the same kind of moderate lesion who had a normal flow reserve. There's been good data comparing CT to nuclear imaging. There's also been showing comparability in outcomes, as well as in the Scott Hart trial, where actually, where they used treadmill testing, CT was actually able to predict better who would benefit from therapy and in terms of outcome. And finally, uh, same kind of data here. So in summary, CT is more than a, a, a test with high diagnostic accuracy. It identifies all stages of atherosclerosis, high, high risk plaque, and um, has the potential for combining FFR, which really lets us identify whether moderate lesions are functionally significant. Thank you very much.